Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you live to episode number 37 of the Primetime Rundown, powered by StreamYard right here on the Eastern Observer and also on channel 198 on Zingo, the I-95 Sports Network. We cannot thank you all enough for joining us here this evening. This show is presented to you by Black Cats NYC. We'll get to their uh, to their to their bid in just a moment, but just to introduce everybody, as always, my two guys, Ian Schreier, Rob DeLuca. I'm Joey Jarzinka. We can't thank you enough for joining us here this Friday evening. It is a uh, rainy Friday evening, a rainy day, if you will, here on the on the uh, on the Northeast and where we are here in New York and New Jersey. But again, as we did say, the little uh, the little bump, if you will, uh, that's what they are called. Uh, Black Black Cats NYC. You heard in the beginning, "Dirty Little Hipster." That is the new hit single from Andrew Giordano's new group, Black Cats NYC. The song currently is available on Apple Music, Deezer, YouTube, SoundCloud, Amazon Music, Google Play, Pandora, and Spotify. So please give that a buy or a stream or whatever you might want to do. <laughs> Hipster available now on all of the platforms near you. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian Schreier. Rob, uh, Ian, how are you, buddy? I I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's, uh, you know, it's great to be back. I can't believe another week has passed so far, but in that week, uh, we've had a little more craziness on the uh, NHL free agency side. We're two wins away from declaring a, uh, a World Series, uh, I should say, a champion in the American League and the National League. And uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to me sounding off on the Jets. So uh, let's get to it. Yeah, yeah, about, about those Jets. We'll get to that in just a minute. But uh, Rob DeLuca, we saw you last week with... Uh, with the uh, with the NHL free agent frenzy special, we uh, it was the three of us, and it was also Patrick McCormick and Dennis Bernstein on here with us. And uh, how has your week been? Yeah, you know, to same old, same old. You know, can't can't really complain too much. You know, it's always it's always good when the when the major sports like to give us news that we can actually talk about come <laughs> come Friday evenings. Yeah. And you know what? It's very funny you speak about that because the news so far has been off the charts today. And uh, something that we were actually talking about uh, earlier uh, earlier off camera was something that uh, actually we'll, we'll get this started. But uh, someone actually that I've looked up to uh, as a hockey player for most of my life has now joined the arch enemy. So uh, <laughs> Joe Thornton, Jumbo Joe Thornton, has left the San Jose Sharks uh, and has signed a one-year their league minimum contract with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And of course, that is his hometown. Uh, league minimum is $700,000. And uh, it, it's very difficult to see to see Jumbo go. First, it was difficult to see uh, the big Pavelski go uh, last year. But now we're having to see round number two uh, in Joe Thornton uh, head out. And you know what? We, we saw the, the big three uh, in Marlowe, Thornton, and Pavelski all go at one point. But of course... As I've told Rob, and I think I told Ian as well, uh, you know, welcome back, Patty Marlowe, round number 9,754, because it almost <laughs> seems like he just keeps on coming back because he lives there, his family lives there, and he's going to do whatever he can uh, to maybe break Gordie Howe's games played record. Who knows? That is, uh, that's something there that he actually came out publicly and said, yeah, and quote unquote uh you know i mean that's that, that that's really it he don't care he just wants to win uh his first stanley cup and i don't think that's going to happen unless he gets traded but um let's do this guys uh we we obviously were just talking about joe thornton earlier one year seven hundred thousand dollars um Sportsnet's brian burke rob deluca said about a few hours ago said it would make quote no sense uh, if Jumbo would sign in Toronto. Talk about uh, if it does make sense, if it doesn't make sense to you, uh, because to me, it honestly makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, uh, look, look, it, it makes sense in terms of he finally got to go home. Like, it, he's been playing, he's a Toronto native, but he's been playing in, Tor uh, in San Jose for the last decade plus, and he's, before that he was in Boston, a, hate, a heated rival of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So there's never, he's never really had the chance to go home. Finally, after many, many years with San Jose, and it's clear that the winning is just not going to happen in San Jose. So time is short. Toronto, on the other hand, always a playoff contender. You, you don't know if they'll get there because the NHL playoffs are very unpredictable, but this is definitely a step in the right direction for Joe to finally get some silverware in his life. It's really crazy because you look at, you look at the signing and you say, Say to yourself, third line center, and 
he could potentially be playing on the number one power play unit. And I personally believe that this signing is absolutely phenomenal. And I think that just by looking at some of the numbers and not only it gives a boost to their power play, but I think it gives, and it's not even an I think, it does. It gives a massive boost to their penalty kill and their defense where forwards do not play de- play defense in Toronto. And they brought in Alexander Kerfoot to be able to do that. Uh, and he couldn't do it. Uh, they also had a lot of defensive defensemen, or supposedly Cody Cece was supposed to be that guy. Tyson Berry, we knew, was going to be the power play quarterback. He could not do that. He signed a one-year deal in Edmonton with a bunch of incentives. And Tyson Berry, uh, he's out – or excuse me, uh, Tyson Be- – yeah, that's what I'm talking about, Tyson Berry. Uh, Cody Cece still on sign. But um, this is this is massive, and especially – Actually, that Kyle Dubas is uh, is getting a lot of these older guys, such as Spezza and now Thornton, to be able to sign for the league minimum. It really shows that they that what we are seeing in Toronto publicly uh, is not all that what's going on there. Because maybe Dubas is doing a good job selling uh, the Leafs uh, to to these I would say former high end free agents. Um, but now again, Joe Thornton at age 41 is going to be the third line center. Jason Spezza is going to be their fourth line guy. And on paper, they look really good. But now we just have to see if the age will become a factor um, with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Ian, I know you had said again before um, before our little uh, before we started up here to leave you out of this. But I see that you're. <laughs> Knowing you, you are itching to always get into the conversation, and that's what we love about you. So do you want to contribute to Joe Thornton heading in? Because as you said earlier, not really discussion worthy. Well, to me, I mean, I always remember Joe Thornton as a San Jose Shark. I mean, I remember when he went from Boston to San Jose, and um, obviously he was in a Stanley Cup final only a few years ago. And it, it is nice from from the Sharks' perspective to see that they're – Finally, or at least seems like they're devoting now to a rebuild. Obviously, they resigned Marlowe, but um, it's nice to see that they're, you know, Pavelski's gone, Thornton's gone. At least it seems like there, there might be, it, it's finally time to rebuild in San Jose, where it always seemed like they were just trying to build up with, with older veterans to try to make one run at a cup. And if they retain Thornton, it seemed like maybe there was still that possibility that they could have one final shot at it, but Thornton goes to Toronto. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't think it's so hard to sell the Maple Leafs. I mean, you have four of the best offensive players in all of hockey in Toronto. I don't think it's hard to sell it. The problem with the Leafs has, and will, will remain until we see some sort of change. And we thought Tyson Barry was going to be that answer is can they have a defense in Toronto? Can they stop opposing teams from putting the puck in the net? I mean, you look at the Maple Leafs in the playoffs and the regular season, they have no problem scoring four or five goals a game. The issue is that they allow five or six. So if you're a player like Jason Spezza or Joe Thornton, who's really on the tail end of their career and trying to win some sort of hardware before they hang up their skates, Toronto wouldn't be a bad place to go. But the problem is, is, is defense has still not been addressed there, and they're going to have a lot of trouble stopping pucks from going in the net. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And again, going back to the defensive side of things, Joe Thornton, um, he has been in the conversation many, many years ago, not, not recently, um, for the Selkie at one point, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, the, the best defensive forward, uh, in the NHL. He, I don't believe he ever won it. Um, but many, many years ago he was before, obviously, uh, Patrice Bergeron would just take every single one, um, and, you know, win it every year. Um, but basically what it comes down to is, is that there are, also banking right now on uh, on Joe Thornton to be able to play on potentially the number one or number two penalty kill unit, and that's a lot to ask for at uh, at, at 41 years of age. And again, with the Sharks, um, as Ian says, and I love to say this because that's it really fits perfectly in our show. He's pl- he was playing with house money as for the Sharks because they knew they weren't getting anywhere, and now I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on Joe Thornton to be able to really be that leader in the locker room. I would not be surprised, by the way, folks, if he gets an A. Uh, and I think that that is that is a bold statement. But I personally do believe with Joe Thornton's, uh, with his resume and what he has done both in Boston and in San Jose, that there could be a possibility of, uh, of shuffling around the A because we have heard lots of bad things with Tavares up there wearing the C. 
Uh, and and really, Morgan Riley not or wearing the A, but then who else could possibly do that and be that leader that could step up if to if, if John Tavares is not that leader that Toronto believed that they were. There's so many articles that have come out saying that he was an $11 million mistake. Um, that's pretty bold. Uh, and especially when you're a captain and you are the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, that is, again, bold. And I think that someone has to come in there and basically boost him. And I think that Joe Thornton checks off all those boxes um, to do that. Going back to San Jose, though, guys, and I don't want to stay on this topic uh, any longer, but I think Doug Wilson is trying to rebuild the 2016 team where he re-signed Matt Nieto uh, from Colorado at the league minimum. Patrick Marlowe, again, Logan Couture, uh, Tomas Hurdle, uh, Marcus Sorensen. These guys, th th these guys, and for some reason, I think we're going back to 2016. <laughs> Why are we doing that? I don't know. Uh, we actually posted uh, our show in the San Jose Sharks fan group, and we're, I'm a part of all of them. So for those that are watching right now, please submit your questions. Uh, we'll, we'll get on to the next topic, but uh, if we do have time, we'll gladly go back and answer your questions. We'd love to and uh, you know get as many uh, viewers and new fans that we can. That would be uh, really a lot of uh, fun for sure as we move on into the next uh, segment. One last thing, Brent Burns will be taken uh, in the uh, expansion draft. And as Ian said earlier, um, you know, time for a rebuild. I don't believe the true rebuild comes until uh, next year when mm -hmm. someone of uh, either Brent Burns or Mark Edward Vlasic is taken in the expansion draft. Uh, guys, let's mo keep moving forward here because again, we didn't want to stay on this topic too long, but um, now with, uh, Alex Petrangelo signing in Las Vegas, this is something that we, that the three of us had a conversation with Dennis Bernstein, uh, from the fourth period with last year. And, uh, the ensuing move following, uh, Petrangelo signing was that, uh, Kelly McCrimmon then eventually traded Nate Schmidt to Vancouver, uh, for a third round pick. And really guys, a third round pick, uh, to be pretty desperate. Uh, what are your thoughts there? And uh, talk about the, I guess I, I want to say return, but then also I want to bring up something that Sportsnet's Brian Burke has said as well. We'll get to that in a second. Start with Ian first. What are your thoughts on Petro going to Vegas? Uh, I mean, it's it's what we all discussed last week on during our free agent frenzy show. It's been rumored for weeks now that he's going to Vegas, and he signed. He signed his seven-year, fifty-six million dollar deal, and it seemed all the more possible he was going to Vegas once St. Louis signed Tory Krug. I know when we spoke to Dennis Bernstein, our insider last week during the show and discussed where does Petrangelo end up, he still thought there was a chance he was going to St. Louis. I, I, I'm sure Alex Petrangelo would have loved to have returned to where he has won a Stanley Cup and where he has had so much success. But the rumors appear to be true. Vegas really tried to unload the cap space and are still trying to unload the cap space to make sure that they can stay under the cap with Petrangelo's number at 8.8 AAV. So... I'm not surprised by the move by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think what that does is, is it, you know, Petrangelo will slot in right at Nate Schmidt's old spot, you know, next to Shea Theodore. But I love the move for Vancouver for Nate Schmidt. Um, I really do. I think it actually gives them a top defensive pairing. I know he was a lifer in Vegas, but um, I think it gives them a top defensive pairing on their second pairing with Jordy Ben. Um, when you have guys like Alex Edler and Quinn Hughes on your top defensive pairing. So I think it really only stretches at, stretches out the Canucks defense. It actually makes them better on defense where they're so strong in the top pairing. They just got a little bit stronger. DeLuca, your thoughts on, uh, on, on Petro and then Schmidt heading to Ve uh, heading to Vancouver. Yes. Pet Petrangelo to Vegas was pretty much expected at this point, as, as Ian said, especially after Krug signed in St. Louis, it pretty much, Seen pretty straightforward because you you can't just hand someone like Toy Krug forty five million dollars and expect them to also keep someone else as high as high prices as Petrangelo, but but I will say about the trade for Schmidt to Vancouver, you you could just smell the desperation on Vegas at that point and Vancouver took full advantage of it. I mean Nate Schmidt is a great great defender in this league. He is worth so much more than a third rounder. You talk so that that's what shocked me the most was. That we were ta we're talking about someone that can will lay the body on the line, throw it in front of a shot if he has to, 
and you're all, and, but and but also just on both sides of the puck, he's a great two way player, and you only get a third rounder for him. I mean, I get you were desperate, but you could have at least gotten a second, even possibly a first. You you could have figured something out there. And and also keep in mind the fact that as I mentioned in my previous point, that Vegas still has to try to shed more money in order to stay under the cap. Right now, they're still over the cap. So the hope was that the Devils were going to go after Marc-Andre Fleury, and now they have Corey Crawford, so they don't need a goaltender now for this year. So they've got to find another way to dump money, and it seems like Fleury is going to be the casualty. But at this point, where exactly is he going? I don't know. Well, the whole thing now is, yeah. guys, is that I don't believe that Flurry is going to be the casualty right now mm-hmm. because um, because Robin Lanner had shoulder surgery. Mm-hmm. Not only that, now they're talking about Alec Martinez potentially being that. Yeah, casualty. I would think I would think it has to be Martinez, Joey. I mean, right? And because of what happened to Robin Lanner, and, and now all of a sudden Vegas has no interest in moving Flurry. Right? They, they think they need to keep him. And yeah. Robin, look, that's a that is a great great tandem let's not let's not be hasty here that is a solid tandem the only issue is the fact of how much money was on the line there with flurry and then giving of course five minutes because now they've got 12 million dollars wrapped up in goaltenders yep. a year so that's a that's a tight space but honestly it, it could be worth it in the long run for or in the short run actually we yeah, yeah because, uh, he's only got two years left so there's no doubt about it and you say that because now um, again, they have to, they have to unload him, uh, at some point. I don't think it's going to be this year. I personally believe that it will be next year. Um, how could it be next year now that I'm saying it? Uh, well, it can't be because, uh, one of the goaltenders will have to be exposed, um, in the C- in the expansion draft. So that won't be. And now I think the biggest thing, guys, here is the emergence of defender Zach Whitecloud as well. He's only getting paid a nice little uh, lump sum of money at seven hundred twenty-five thousand for the next two years before he becomes an RFA at age twenty-three. He is the number two right-handed defenseman on Vegas. Let's not forget, everybody. Uh, Alex Petrangelo is the, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first right hand right-hand shot defensemen. On this team, in its existence, because Nate Schmidt is a left-handed shot and always played on the right side, they have a plethora of left-handed shots. Um, and I think the craziest, excuse me, the craziest thing too, fellas, is that uh, Petro got 8.8 million AAV at age 30. But Ian, I think we spoke about this. All seven years is no move, no. Yeah. Move. No movement clause. Guys, I want to I want to go to the two of you there. Did Kelly McCrimmon make a humongous mistake where it is a no movement for seven full years? Yes or no? Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. I mean, look. Look, he's he's going to be worth it for the first couple of years. There's not even a question in mind. And if they and if they do manage to go the whole way, and at some point, and get the ch- and get the cup, then I guess it doesn't matter. However, there's definitely going to be some, if they don't do it, especially there's going to be some regret on the back end of that contract. But the only beauty of it is right now, if there was no uh, the flat cap, kind of saved Vegas here because Petrangelo would have been worth so much more money if there was if the cap had gone up. The fact that it stayed flat kept him at eight point eight million. So when the cap eventually does go up again in just two years, that's going to look beautiful. That that contract's actually going to look pretty beautiful. Minus we the think, cost. we think it will go up. We think. I mean, we, we, I would like to assume for now it's all, it's only certain it's this it's this year and next year, and then after that it, it supposedly would go up again. We would like to hope it does. Right. But yeah. So if it so if it does, it will look that much better. But yes, the no movement clause for all the years could be a very crucial mistake because you, you just never know what could happen. You know, these, these are the kinds of moves that end up hurting a team in the long run. Like, you know, you could find yourself in an LTIR situation, you know, God forbid, but you know, crazier things have happened in this sport and it's dangerous to do a full, full NMC for the entire length of the contract. Look at Pavel Datsuk. Look at Marion Hosa. Right. Look at Henrik Zetterberg. Look at Johan Franzen as well. All those guys that we mentioned, Marion Gabrick, that's five. 
uh, have all ended up uh, had had more more than I believe at least five million dollars and more. Uh, or actually, excuse me, uh, Marion Gabrick was 4.875, so j- over 4.5. All five of those guys uh, that we mentioned have all landed on the long-term IR, and all of their careers are over. Uh, Ian Schreier, your thoughts. Uh, did Kelly McCrimmon make a mistake with a no movement for eight full or for seven full years? I don't even know whether or not they really needed Alex Petrangelo in the first place. I mean, uh, it's... Uh, I think it would have made sense for him to stay in St. Louis. The Vegas Golden Knights have a team, a formidable team, that was more than ready to make a run at a Stanley Cup um, had they not come up short in their goal. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to be said uh, for th- this this movement, uh, I should say, for the no movement clause at this many years. I, I think with respect to uh, Nate Schmidt, as a, I apologize, you're actually <laughs> – if you're hearing my uh, daughter crying from, from – That is okay. I apologize to, the, uh, to everyone that's, uh, that's watching the show. But, uh, I mean, it seemed like for, for a very short time, even during the whole Petrangelo signing process, that um, they would find a way to retain Nate Schmidt. It wasn't, it wasn't initial, the fact that they were going to try to trade him or unload him in some way. So it seemed like they were going to try to sign Petrangelo and still keep Schmidt on the payroll. So – I don't know if he may – I mean, I would say yes. I, I just don't think that they actually needed him. I believe that they didn't need him. And this is something else that um, that Sportsnet's Brian Burke made a fantastic point. And when I heard this, it really – like it started making sense the more he spoke about it. And he said the more these players sign or as – or Kelly McCrimmon or George McPhee – he used it as this. He said it was similar to a junior hockey club or even a fantasy hockey team where guys are being picked up off a of free agency and then guys that sign these humongous long-term deals are getting shipped away. And at some point, if that continues to happen, where we could potentially see Shea Theodore after year number three of his, of his, uh, of his long-term deal eventually get shipped out, or maybe a guy such as William Carlson gets shipped out because he needs to be a cap casualty because there's someone better out there that they could re-sign to a massive deal. That could be a turnaway for some free agents who may want to stay uh, in Las Vegas for the long term. And if these guys, some of them that do not have, let's say, no movement clauses or no or no trade clauses. Uh, where you could potentially have, and this is the perfect guy that that he brought up, was Marc-Andre Fleury, was where he would be the guy, and then all of a sudden you fire Gerard Gallant, your original head coach, you bring in Pete DeBoer, as they said, the best head coach available because Gerard was not getting it done. Well, why would you want to sign there long-term if someone is going to come to you in two or three years and say, hey, listen, can you waive that clause because we see someone better? So why would I want to sign there when you're not going to keep your word of keeping me for seven full years? That I think is the biggest thing. And I'm a hundred percent with Ian and Rob there. I think Kelly McCrimmon beyond made a mistake with a no movement clause, because at some point it is going to be uh, a casualty. I do believe. And I think it's going to be similar to what's going on with Johnny Boychuk right now in the New York Islanders, where they need to get him out. And he has a, a, a no trade clause. And I personally do believe uh, Zach Whitecloud is not a flash in the pan. This guy who is a right-handed shot will be, um, he will be a top, uh, a top four defenseman uh, in, in a few years. I personally believe. Um, so again, it, it's there's a lot of a lot of discussion with uh, with hockey, and uh, I personally believe that right after uh, our show last week, uh, things just happen after our show, and that's why I said I believe it because every time we go on the air after eight o'clock, and times sometimes we do go over a few minutes, and uh, and we expect some breaking news to drop, and of course, just about ten minutes after we had our conversation, fellas, Tori Krug signed a massive deal in St. Louis. How convenient, right? (laughs) Uh, But we have a little something else here, and I personally believe, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to be bold here, and I'm going to say this. Um, To all my New York Islanders fans, 
uh, out there that say Devontae's, uh, that trade was horrendous, shut up. Everyone shut up because you don't know what you're talking about then. And you know what? You have to understand where Lou Lamarillo is coming from. We're going to get to Ian and Rob in a second, but I need to rant about this. You got two second round picks in 2021 and 22. One or potentially two of those will be going to eventually re-sign Matthew Barzell and potentially a sniper. You have a depth for defense. You have a plethora of defenders in Bridgeport that are going to be really good at entry-level deals. It is the time for Nick Letty, for Johnny Boychuk, to eventually head out the door. I'm sorry, it stings, but if you could not get, especially in this flat cap world and pandemic that we are living in, where some teams, not all 31 teams, but some teams out there are not capable of getting a, a long-term IR spot or even just a, 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 a basically dead money or bringing in dead money to help out their their uh, their fellow team or whatever, or fellow organization, if you will, guess what? Cry about it. You have to get out. You have to make a sacrifice in order to win. This is a good problem that the Islanders have. This is not a bad problem. This is a very good problem. I don't want to hear it anymore. It's done. Devontae's is gone. There had to be a sacrifice. Ian Schreier, your thoughts when we heard that Lou Lamarillo traded Devontae's for two second round picks that we all know in this room here will not ever be seen by the Islanders. I do understand from a lot of the Isles fans' perspective why they're upset. The Islanders just had a run to the Eastern Conference Finals. They were two wins away from going to Stanley Cup Final. I understand why you don't want to see some of these key pieces, especially key young pieces, when you still have contracts tied up like Andrew Ladd, Johnny Boychuk, Nick Letty. You have a young player in your core like Devon Taves, who was a key part of this deep run in the postseason, and now you're shipping them off to another team for two draft picks. I understand that they only have around $9 million in cap space, to re-sign Matthew Barzell, Ryan Pulak, and then after that, they still need to try and go out and get another elite goal scorer, okay? But how much of that is contingent upon them unloading Johnny Boychuk and unloading a Leo Komarov? Like, those are the two names that we're seeing a lot that are being rumored to be moved. Boychuk's name picked up a lot of steam last week. We haven't seen it as much the last few days. Leo Komarov, there's been some whispers, but not much. So... There's talk now that they're going to re-sign Andy Green, which would give them, which would keep that veteran defenseman for them, um, who was a, a huge part of their <clears throat> blue line during their postseason run. And there's talk about them finally reclaiming Matt Martin. As much as I would have loved to have seen the Rangers sign him, it looks like he's going to stay on Long Island, and I'm sure Joey's thrilled about that. But at nine around nine million in cap space, how much are you committing to these guys, and how much is contingent on the fact what happens? If Boychuk and Kamarov don't go anywhere, is Matthew Barzal now and Ryan Pulak now playing on one-year contracts and now going to test unrestricted free agency? There's a lot of questions right now for Lou Lamarell. Yeah, there's no doubt about it there is. And uh, I want to hear Rob DeLuca because obviously for many, many years, his New Jersey Devils uh, were blessed to have uh, or to win three Stanley Cups under the helm of then-general manager Lou Lamarello. Yeah, Joe, you know, I got to just say, you really hit the nail on the head there. You, your rant was beyond perfect. Like, you you got to – you take it from someone who has only known Lou Lamorello for the 25 – essentially, the, the 25 years he's been around, I guess 20 years, the first 20 years it was a, a Lou Lamorello. <laughs> Let the man work. He knows what he's doing. He creates winners. He Yes, Barry Trotz deserves a lot, and I mean – a boatload of credit for that deep playoff run, but you can't not credit Lou Lamorello either. He does things the right way. Look, yes, Devontae's great player, possibly going to be an elite. There's not enough room for for everything the Islanders need between get, signing Barzell, signing Pulak. Look, he made his choice. He chose Pulak over Tays. You know, it was it arguably could have been one or the other. Did he make the right choice? Time will tell. 
Well, something else I just want to interrupt you for one quick second. There was some chatter uh, out here on Long Island that once Devontae's elected arbitration, that basically that, uh, from what we heard, ticked off Lou Lamarillo and basically said, okay, your time is up because are you going to be a team player and take whatever that we offer you? Or are you going to be a me first type of guy and elect arbitration? And he chose the latter. So from what the rumblings that we hear out here on Long Island is that the latter happened and Lou Lamarillo had no choice but to go and say to Joe Sackick, okay, well, now it's time. Or, you know, say, okay, everybody, Devontae's is available. We can't afford him at whatever he may ask for, which could potentially be, and there was some chatter again also, at around 4 or $5 million a year. You can't do that. You can't do that when Matthew Barzell already is – going to be in between seven and 10, which again, there is some uh, disconnect between Lamarillo and Barzell's camp. Uh, back to, to uh, Devontae's Rob DeLuca. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, he's going to be very good. There's no doubting that. It, Matt, but yes, as a matter of time, whether Pulak or Taze was the right decision, we have to wait and see. But look, they, they ju- you just have to let Lou work. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to produce winning franchises. Just let the man do what he is paid to do. And I guarantee you, soon enough, as long as you keep Barry Trotz around and most of the and all this core right now, because there's not a lot of a lot of work to be done. I guarantee you Lou Lamorello is not done in terms of big and possibly even trades. He probably isn't done yet. The man works in mysterious ways. He he's very secretive. That's why you never ever see an Islanders leak. The, the moment you see an Islanders leak Take it to the bank because it's either going to be gone within the minute or it's going to get canceled. So you have to just work with it. Believe me, from someone who had him as a GM for the first 20 years of existence, he can be frustrating at times with some moves, but in the long run, it always pays off. In in uh, in 22 playoff games this year, Devontae's – recorded 10 points, two goals, eight assists, and a plus three plus minus rating during the regular season, 68 total games, six goals, 22, uh, 22 assists, 28 uh, total points, uh, and a plus one plus minus rating. Something else too, guys, um, that Lou Lamarillo has to deal with as well. Uh, a lot of people were saying, well, why did he sign Leo Komarov when he knew that he would at some point have to fix Garth Snow's mess? which would be Andrew Ladd, Nick Letty, and Johnny Boychuk in about two years. Well, guess what? Here we are. Uh, We are two years in, and now he has to fix his mess. Well, the reason why is because, well, guess what? We weren't expected to do much, and we knew coming into into the uh, tenure of both Barry Trotz and Lou Lamorello that the defense was putrid the year before under Doug Wade and Garth Snow. We knew that it was absolutely horrendous and probably a historic low in how many goals the Islanders gave up the year before. So at some point, you have to basically make a chance. You have to take a chance and say, all right, we're gonna we're going to bring in Leo Komarov, and we're going to say, how can we get him? Him to help lead these guys who really have no idea how to play defense, but all of a sudden it really worked out for them. And now it becomes sort of a loop problem. But then again, we said last week, or I said last week that the Islanders um, had a lot of, or the Islanders had to, or excuse me, Garth Snow had to, had to be given credit for everything where, where the Islanders are right now. But now at some point, we, again, we hear Lou Lamorello say, uh, people are saying to Lou, why did you sign Leo if you knew that this was going to be a problem and then you would have to ship out a fourth-round pick that could potentially become a superstar? Ladies and gentlemen, there is someone named Bo- Bode Wildy down in Bridgeport. There is someone else also named Samuel Bolduc down in Bridgeport. Those two guys will eventually be on the blue line. Noah Dobson is ready to go. We saw him uh, in the playoffs this year, only for one game, but – a little bit of jitters in the beginning of the game eventually saw that he was able to do what he was able to do and what they drafted him for just a few years ago. And again, that is another Garth Snow selection. Um, guys, I w- excuse me, I want to keep moving forward because uh, we can talk about the Islanders all day long here. Uh, a couple of uh, a couple of notes here. It's going to be uh, Nolan Patrick. He was out all of last year. We completely forgot about his uh, about him 
period. Uh, $874,125. He accepted his qualifying offer from Flyers uh, general manager Chuck Fletcher because he was out uh, last year. And also, uh, actually, right from uh, from our insider and our good friend, uh, Dennis Bernstein from the fourth period reports that Quinton Byfield has signed his entry-level contract four years, 925000 AAV. So pretty cool stuff for the uh, the highest uh, drafted African American player in the game of hockey ever. Really, really cool stuff. So again, DB, thank you very much for that tweet, guys. Let's keep moving forward here, and I think it is the time now where <laughs> we can bring it up here, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. It is this segment, and la- and I think we have to make sure that we have some. So we'll have to give Seth McFarlane a call right now and say, "Are we okay <laughs> using this?" And I'm sure he would say yes. No, I don't think he would, but. It is our time. It is the time for what really grinds my gears. And Peter Griffin here is actually uh, Ian Schreier. So uh, Ian will give the folks out there watching a little bit of a preview of what you are going to be ranting about. (laughs) You are going to be ranting and looking like this at the same time. So uh, the New York Jets are an absolute atrocity. They are abysmal. Uh, they released Le'Veon Bell uh, a few days ago, and he has now since signed with the Kansas City Sheet, the Kansas City Chiefs, the defending Super Bowl Fifty Four champions. Ian Schreier, what is wrong with the Jets? Uh, I don't think there's really much more to ask. I'm going to ask everyone to just please bear with me as I try to get through everything that's on my chest. And I'm not even a New York Jets fan. I'm a I'm a, I'm a lifelong Giants fan. And and this is how much everything with the New York Jets is upsetting me. Rob has sat back. Look, look, he, he's getting. <laughs> I'm ready. He's ready. He's ready. He's ready. He's about to get a bowl of popcorn out. <laughs> I, oh, I saw so one. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the person, the problem with that franchise is Adam Gase. And I, and I know every Jet fan, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. But the yeah. problem is, yes, yes, the, the yeah. eye <laughs> is who really, let, 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 let's, let's look at this logically. Who really right now has more pull in that front office, Joe Douglas or Adam Gase? Okay, let's take it from the first year. Let's, let's go back two years to when Adam Gase came in and, and stepped in as the head coach of the New York Jets. Jamal Adams your cornerstone defensive player in the secondary. The guy looks like he never wants to leave New York. Adam Gase walks into the building, has instant disagreements the first season with Jamal Adams. Jamal Adams wants out, gets traded to Seattle. Le'Veon Bell was signed to the second largest contract for a running back in NFL history at that time, days, literally days, before Adam Gase was named the team's head coach. The second he's named the team's head coach, he decide, he says, I don't want him. Okay, so you just signed, like I said, the one of the best running backs in the game, at that time at least, one of the best running backs in the game. He comes to the Jets that's in dire need. I mean, they've already had issues with dealing with pass-catching running backs in the past. Let, let us not forget how the Jets misused Matt Forte when they brought him to New York. You know, in Chicago, he built his legacy on the fact that he was a pass-catching running back, and this is exactly what Le'Veon Bell did in Pittsburgh. Yet, for some reason, they're just asking Le'Veon Bell to run north-south and not throw the ball to him. Okay, so he get Gates doesn't want him. He gets cut. Where does he sign? Oh, I'm going to sign with the defending Super Bowl champions over signing with Buffalo and Miami. That's not a bad idea. Your quarterback's Patrick Mahomes. you got a future running back over there in Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. How bad could that be? And, oh, by the way, after this weekend, I think the Jets go play a team known as the Kansas City Chiefs. So I'm sure Le'Veon Bell cannot wait for that matchup. And then how about the fact now that Joe Douglas is shopping Quinnen Williams, which I only just found about today. He's shopping Quinnen Williams, your number one draft pick from last year. Granted, he didn't have a good first year. You're ready to blow it up all over again after what? two years, three years, now all of a sudden we're blowing it all up all over again. I mean, granted, we knew that that was the road that the Jets were going down. How about Adam Gase and Ryan Tannehill? Except for one year, Ryan Tannehill has now rejuvenated his career in Tennessee. All of a sudden he's playing for Mike Vrabel, no longer playing for Adam Gase, and Ryan Tannehill is finally the quarterback that we all thought he could be when he came out of Texas A&M however many years ago now. Adam Gase's postgame press conferences – says two weeks ago that our practices need to be better. A week later, he says, what we're doing in practice now needs to translate on the field. 
what? <laughs> Wait, what? You just said two weeks ago your practices aren't good. That we. <laughs> I don't know if I'm referring to Nelson Aguilar in that respect. <laughs> okay, here, better. There <laughs> I mean, we've said week upon, week after week, Chris Johnson refers to Adam Gase as an offensive genius. People are waiting for Woody to come back. I'm not so sure that that's so much of an upgrade right now for the Jets franchise, considering he was the man that said, I'm going to bring in Brett Favre just to increase ticket sales. Okay. So there's that part of that. Um, and remember, Gase, I'm finding out now, was hired on behalf of the fact that Peyton Manning, because again, some, something again I brought up on this show repeatedly, that he was Peyton Manning's quarterbacks coach in Denver when he didn't need a quarterbacks coach, says, you got to hire this guy. Adam Gase is an offensive genius. Hello, the last three or four years, his team has been ranked at the bottom of the NFL in total offense. Okay, bottom of the NFL, 28th, 31st, 29th, I believe, are the rankings for four. Adam Gase's offense the last three years. OK, so I think the Mannings need to just enjoy their legacies as great quarterbacks in the National Football League and not talk about what head coaches would be great or what quarterback out of Duke because you have a relationship with David Cutcliffe would be the best quarterback to serve the Giants. Just enjoy your retirement and enjoy your legacy. Enjoy your nationwide commercials. OK, like at this point, I don't need this. These franchises don't need any more recommendations from the Mannings. OK, and then lastly, is it a scary thought that. I think their only winnable game on their schedule, maybe, and considering Ryan Fitzpatrick's having a solid year and eventually they're going to have to go to Tua because you drafted him and eventually if you're out of the playoff picture, you really need to look at your future. If they don't beat one, win one of those games against Miami, I have a hard time looking. I was looking at their schedule the other night. I have a hard time looking down their schedule and not seeing how this team doesn't go 0-16. And what's scary to me is that I think Joe Douglas could be out the door well before Adam Gase is. I think Gase has that ownership's ear. I think he's got ownership tied up. I don't think Adam Gase is going anywhere. They had, they had sent scouts to watch their game against Denver, which, which, good for you, that was your best offensive performance. You did it against the Broncos, one of the worst defensive teams without one of their franchise defensive players in Von Miller. So Adam Gase doesn't look like he's going anywhere. So how scary is it that if they go on 16 and let go of Joe Douglas – in 2021, Adam Gates could be working with his third general manager. Think about that. So it's not it's the general manager and not the head coach. I just don't get it. The problem there is Adam Gates. Jet fans know it's Adam Gates. The problem is ownership doesn't know it's Adam Gates. And I think the bottom line here, Ian, is that you, you said it perfectly. It's the ownership that is an absolute disgrace. Um, and it's very evident that – there is nothing that can be done. I think that even right when you traded Jamal Adams as well, and, and I always bring this up, with Bradley McDougald, right away, he brought up something with practice where it was not working right away. And he called Adam Gase and the New York Jets out publicly to the New York media. And he was there, I think, for not even double-digit days yet. And he brought up how the practices were not were not good. Not only were they not good, when you have someone that comes in here and he knows that he's just, you know, a filler, basically one of those throw-in guys to, you know, okay, make the New York Jets happy or to complete the trade. You would think that, okay, you're going to come in, you're going to play, you're going to – do your best efforts to eventually get the hell out of there. Not say a word, just do your job, whatever. But clearly, the New York Jets, there's something going on there. And you said it, Ian. It's Adam Gase. And ownership clearly loves Gase. Or maybe Adam Gase has something on the Johnsons that, I don't know, maybe there's some blackmail or something that's going on there. because I, I don't know what it could be, Joey. I mean, you look at the whole... Let's take it back for a second to Le'Veon Bell. His press conference after they trade Le'Veon Bell, I forgot who asked him the question in the press conference. They asked him, did you misuse him? I mean, the, the answer was yes. I mean, I mean, granted, he hasn't had the healthiest career since he's been a Jet, but he says that's irrelevant right now. He's not wrong per se, but the fact that you're completely ignoring the fact that you didn't even want him there in the first place. Right. And I think the scary thing too, fellas, is, is that it's very difficult to see that 
Joe Douglas is not going to fire Adam Gase. Definitely not. And it stings because usually how in professional sports it goes is, is general manager brings in their head coach. Well, we knew exactly as we said, Mike McCagnan brought in Adam Gase. He was then let go. He was fired. And then they bring in Joe Douglas. Okay, well, Joe Douglas, I can almost guarantee you from all of his years with the Philadelphia Eagles where he's on, I don't want to say, and, and he won the Super Bowl ring obviously with them, under Howie Roseman. We'll get to that later on. But what it comes down to is, is that I think he knows what he's talking about and we've seen it in his draft because this past year's draft for the New York Jets was, I thought, one of the best ones that they've had in a very long time. And the, the recoup for Jamal Adams that they got in return for him was fantastic. And now, as Ian said, that you're most likely going to be shopping your number one pick, Quinn and Williams. What? 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 The, what? Yeah. That that, yeah. that is that is in all honesty the look that New York Jets fans should be giving their ownership and saying, "Why are we spending money here? What are we doing?" Ian Schreier knows a lot about this with the New York Mets. What are we doing here? Rob DeLuca, your thoughts and conclude the New York Jets. Yeah. Look, they're a dumpster fire. I I. I I think that's literally the nicest way I could put it. They make me feel good about being a Giants fan. And <laughs> there is nothing to feel good about with being a Giants fan. The only thing to feel good about being a Giants fan is that I am not a Jets fan. And that is literally <laughs> there's no hope whatsoever in the city of New York. And yet the Jets give me a reason to get out of bed on Sunday mornings. Because it can't possibly be worse. And the fact of the matter is, is that Adam Gase is going to make it the whole season and then be fired probably, which is still a crime. Because you let him stay this long, which is just un... I don't, even, I, can't, I don't even think there's a strong enough word to describe the stupidity behind this. The Jets will never seek happiness... Until the owners sell. What like what have you what have they seen? That's my question. That's my yeah. own question for the fans out there too. What have you seen from Adam Gase before he came to New York, since he's come to New York and coached the Jets? What have you seen? Is there anything that you've seen? And, and and we invite comments, we invite anything at this point for you to tell us maybe why Adam Gase is still there. I'm not even so sure anyone can tell us why Adam Gase is still there. And then you're right, Joey, 100%. I was really impressed with the Jets' draft this past year, not simply because they went out and drafted an offensive tackle in the first round, not simply because somehow Denzel Mims fell to them in the third round, was because Joe Douglas was trading back and trading back and trading back and gaining and gaining draft capital, something the Jets so desperately needed. Now, I, I didn't agree with a couple of their picks last year in the draft in which they – from the draft capital that they gained out of it later in the draft this past this past year. Right. But what you're telling me is by now shopping Quinn and Williams is you're starting all over again. You're starting all over again. So Joe Douglas may not even be there by the time this franchise even figures out how to turn it around. I think he may want I think he may just I think he may just say, "All right, you know what? You could tell everyone that you fired me, but I want out of here." I just I think it is it is so bad in on the other side of MetLife Stadium that right now we look at the numbers for offense, defense, passing, and rushing for the New York Jets. They're ranked 29th in team offense. They're ranked 27th in team defense. They are ranked 30th out of 32 in team passing, and they are also ranked 22nd, which is their little blemish in team rushing. So I guess that's a little bright spot, if you will. Not blemish, sorry. That's a little bright spot. Um, it, it's, it is beyond pathetic that ownership at 0-5, where we heard rumblings following the Indianapolis Colts game, where they lost big. Okay, They, almost, they lost by, I think it was 28 or 29 points, by four touchdowns. Yeah. Then you lose to Denver. And as Ian 
perfectly said their best offensive performance this entire season. And then, hold on, folks, just to make matters worse, then in the last game against the Arizona Cardinals, you lose by 20, 30 to 10. And then, as Ian then went on to say, is that it gets better. It gets better because in three weeks, the Kansas City Chiefs will be playing the New York Jets. And the best part about the whole thing is that the Jets are going to be paying Kansas, uh, uh, Le'Veon Bell's salary to then kick their butts. <laughs> That's going to be the best part. But you know what? Really, I think before we even move to week number eight, how about week six, guys? Week six is against Ryan Fitzmagic. Fitzpatrick, ladies and gentlemen, he is going to make the New York Jets 0-6. It is hilarious, and, and there is no way, and I'm looking here in the next three games, Ian, as you, you said perfectly, I do not believe the Jets will win another game just by looking at the schedule. New England is, has not lost a beat. The only thing that they lost was Cam Newton to COVID. And he's, like he's, ready to go. he's ready to go. The LA Chargers. Hey, the emergence of Justin Herbert. I don't know, guys. He's looking pretty good out there, too. And again, it again, now we can't really say home home field advantage because there's no fans there. We're starting to see more and more now pick up, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. But then week number 12. And I want to go through this whole season because Ian, you, you made a perfect point. In terms Thank of you. 16. No, you really did because now it, it, it gets me to wonder and, and really all the Jets fans to wonder too, could they really go 0-16? The Miami Dolphins, week number 12. Um, by that point, who knows? That is after the trade deadline. And also, mind you, who knows if you're going to have Quinn and Williams there. So if you don't and if you just completely blow it up, okay, well, then you know what? Then I guess we're going for Trevor Lawrence again. Uh, 0-12. Or sorry, 0-11. Week number 13 against the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, that one is, in my opinion, a coin toss. And I think that is a very, very, very bold statement by myself. Because guess what? The Raiders, yeah, they they, they came out and made and had it, played a statement game against the Chiefs. But then you also lost by more than 25 points to the New England Patriots. And in Foxborough, granted, uh, it's a tough place to play. There's no fans, so it really doesn't make a difference. Um, and then you're going to Seattle against the worst, one of the worst uh, uh, secondaries in the NFL. I can't believe the Eagles are not in that conversation. <laughs> um, the LA Rams, the LA Rams, uh, guys, there could be four teams out of the NFC West making the playoffs. They lose that game. That's 0 and 14. The Cleveland Browns are back. Uh, they're going to be hosting them. Uh, Ian, this this schedule has 0 and 16 written all over it. It's uh, the only games, I, and I was looking through their schedule the other day. The only games that I saw that were potentially winnable were Miami, who they still have to play twice. The only reason that they're playing the Dolphins in Miami this week, they were originally supposed to play them in Miami mid-November, but because yeah. of the COVID rescheduling, they were supposed to play the Chargers this weekend. Nevertheless, um, the only other games I thought that they may stand a chance against were maybe the Raiders. Um, it, the game's at home, so they do have that no-fan home field advantage, I guess, a little bit. And then Cleveland. I, I'm not ready to say Cleveland's back yet. I think they've been they've I'm actually been yet. beneficial, and we'll get to them in a sec. I think they've, they've benefited from a very very favorable schedule. Um, sure. If you have to look at their last four weeks, uh, I think every team that they've beaten is actually under 500. So uh, I think those are some possible winnable games. Let's see where we stand by that point. I mean, you're talking about Cleveland's week 16. Vegas is a few weeks before that. So I mean, hopefully. Ownership opens their eyes and decides to make a coaching change or or change something. Like it's it's like the, it's like the scene from Spaceballs when they say do something, do something, do something. Like it's <laughs> do something. Like it's like how I mean I have a hard time as a Giants fan understanding how Dave Gettleman still has a job. Like do do something. Like this is not respectable. You need like year after year. I used to say under Woody Johnson, he used to just try to find the next free agent that would sell tickets. Brett Favre, okay, well, Chris Johnson certainly took one out of his book and got Le'Veon Bell. Okay, two years later, he's gone. Like, just learn from your mistakes and move on. The Jets can never seem to do that. Something else, yeah. too, guys. There was a uh, an article that came out. Who is the best New York sports team? And uh, Ian Schreier, i got to ask you, 
who was that best sports team that that uh, that they said? <laughs> the Buffalo Bills. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. I mean, listen, you got to give credit where you got to give credit where credit's due. It is. It's certainly the team that plays at Nassau Coliseum, Barclays Center, UBS Arena, whichever arena they. Uh, no, listen, I'm very, I'm very thrilled for them that they're going to have a home, a, a permanent home by next year. It's definitely the New York Islanders. There's no question. Yeah, about it. It's. Uh, but I, I don't think the, and I, I mean certainly uh, the Yankees are in the playoffs every year, so it's always nice to have them in the conversation. I don't think the Mets are too far behind as long as no, you know spends money. But, you know, as long as ownership spends money, I think they'll be the next discussion for the next best sports team in New York. But yeah. kudos to the Islanders; they have the right coach in place, the right GM in place. There's no doubt about it. Let's stay on topic here, yeah, Joey. Not. I have to interject though, because you said it, and it's been irking me. I've been trying to say it for the last three minutes. I'm stealing this quote directly from a Dolphins fan I saw on Twitter. Everyone knows the real Fitz magic is now in New Jersey. In Tom Fitzgerald. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real Fitz magic is now. It's all over in my. There's only so much Fitz magic that can go around. And right now it's in New Jersey. So the Dolphins might be in a little bit of trouble this weekend. Well, we're going to see what the deal is because, guys, uh, again, as we brought up, a combined 0 and 9, um, or excuse me, a combined 0 and 10 between. Never happened before. I believe, I, I can't remember what the graphic said. I believe it's the first time in NFL history that both the Jets and Giants have been a combined 0 and 10 yeah. ever, I believe. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, I believe that that is correct. And really, uh, guys, it's it's really crazy to see that statistic, and then to hear, as we said, and the joke that I had made is that you know the New York Islanders were the best team this year. Who would have thought that? No one would have thought that. I would have never thought that. No one would have ever thought that. You know, if we rewind to two thousand seven, uh, it, it just it, it doesn't doesn't ever happen. Uh-huh. Well, you have to like what you saw, Joey, and I hate to interject, but you have to as an Islanders fan, and you yourself, Joey, and anybody else that's watching that's an Islanders fan, you you had to be happy with what you saw a year earlier. I mean, listen, oh, yeah. they didn't just sweep the Penguins because the Penguins are old or the Penguins are, 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 are kind of on their hind legs in terms of their last years. They swept the Penguins. They were every bit better than the Penguins in that series last year. They just ran into some really hot goaltending with Carolina. Yeah. I, no matter what the Islanders tried to do in that series, it just seemed like they could not slip one pass when they really needed to against Carolina, simply because Morazic and McElhinney were that good. I'm not shocked that the Islanders got as far as they did. I'm shocked more because of the way they went into the break and the way they came out of the break. Yes. It was probably the best thing for them. They're basically more, I mean, they're much better than this, but I would call them the NHL's version of the Miami Marlins in terms of how the break really helped them. I think that's a good analogy. Yeah. So there's yeah. so much to like about the Islanders. I mean, look, I think that, I mean, I think, we're going to start to hear the Hoffman rumors. I know we're jumping back to hockey here, but I think we're going to see the Hoffman rumors start to hush hush a little more with the Islanders, just because I don't think they have the money, and I'm not sure they're really going to be able to unload Johnny Boychuk and Leo Kamara. I really don't think anyone's going to take on that kind of salary dump. However, you still have to like which which direction this team is heading, and it, it, there, there's so much to like. A plus well, safe season to keep it simple. There, that it was that simple. So now, now, as we said earlier, and we head back on track with football, uh, yes, there was an article written uh, that the, you know, in terms of records, in terms of where each New York team has gone, that does include the Buffalo Bills, uh, that the New York Islanders in the year 2019-20, or in that combined year between the two years or that, you know, season, if you will, uh, the New York Islanders have gone the farthest. Um, So with an Eastern Conference final run, so definitely kudos to them. But going back to what we said, a combined 0-10 with the Giants and the Jets, it's really, really surreal to see how Adam Gase and Dave Gettleman both have jobs. Because you know what? We look how bad we look at how bad of a job Dave Gettleman has done, but we look how it's the opposite on on both both sides of the stadium here, guys. Yeah. Uh, Dave Gettleman has done a horrid job. Joe Douglas has done a fanta- done a fantastic job. Joe Joe Judge has done a fantastic job where his defense is absolutely surreal, by the way, which we have to give a lot of credit for, especially me. Uh, I really do. They are uh, team ranked 13th 
13th in the entire NFL, uh, and actually on my fantasy team this year, uh, this week. Yes, ladies. But, did you just say the New York Giants defense is on your fantasy? Team? That's correct. Yes. I yeah. mean, look, if they're going to find a win somewhere, it's this weekend. That's correct. Run yeah. out of, then I'm start. I yeah. start to lead hope here. Yes. Well, they're actually they're 13th overall in defense, but I believe they're actually a top five passing defense. They are. Top right. five passing yeah. defense. And, and there, and, and I said this, and actually it's very funny, guys, because I don't want to toot my own horn here. But I know for a fact that when Logan Ryan was signed, I said, and Jabril Peppers and you guys were all like, no, it's not going to be. This defense has the potential to be very, very good. Yep. And Xavier yeah. McKinney, Xavier McKinney is still out. He is not back When he there comes now. back, oh boy, I'm going to be excited, Joey. And let me tell you this right now. This defense can and will be good yep. if the offense can ever give them a damn break. Yep. Listen, I think the right head coach is in place. Yeah. Finally, you saw it during training camp. You've seen it in games. They are buying into the Joe Judge philosophy. It, maybe we could finally see a Bill Belichick coaching disciple actually work out here in the NFL as a head coach. It's still this team is still two, three years away, uh, but they need a new GM in there that works with analytics, that that is a more, um, I should say, uh, contemporary coach, which is more up-to-date on what needs to be done. It, it just needs to happen. I mean, listen, they're not prying John Lynch away from San Francisco, but this team needs a new GM. They need to get the right players in place, especially offensively. They need to know whether Daniel Jones is the quarterback going forward. If not, is Trevor Lawrence a play? We, or Justin Fields up from Ohio State a play? So, but... Going back to Joe Judge here for a second, you just got to like where this team is headed, at least at the head coach position. Yeah, it, it really is the truth where, again, this team can really, really be good. And on both sides of the of the stadium, as we said, it is a one, one good general manager, one bad head coach, and vice versa on the opposite side. Uh, guys, again, we just as we conclude this New York Giants uh, segment or we speak about uh, – actually, we're concluding the New York Jets segment because we're still technically on that. Um, Dave Gettleman, actually, as we did say, and this is something that we also said where he uses a we to do some scouts. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those that did not believe me, here you are. What is he holding there, guys? He is holding a Nintendo Wii remote scouting his team against the Philadelphia Eagles. A An NFL head general manager is using a Nintendo Wii to, 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 to do his scouting. I, I will tell you this, that at the NFL level, when we do stats, are we the remote that we use to look back replays if we need to check tackles, if there's anything we need to check, we do it with an Xbox remote. So I don't know if that's if that is something that we see a lot in the NFL where they're using video game remotes to serve as the purpose to rewind, fast forward, whatever the case may be. But I will tell you that with the New York Jets and probably many other of franchises throughout the NFL, we do use an Xbox remote for replay. So I just want to let you know, I'm not trying to defend Dave Gettleman here, but it, it, it's certainly possible that they do use a Wii remote to uh, to rewind and fast forward. But so you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. You know what, Ian? This is the only time. No, listen, this is the only- <laughs> I, I, when Dave Gettleman was hired, I was definitely on boat on the boat. I remember listening to the press conference when he got hired, and he sent, seemed intent. He went in. He got rid of Jerry Reese. He got rid of Mark Ross. He got rid of he got rid of that entire front office and started from scratch. There was nothing not to love about what he was doing. He says, "I'm going to fix the hog mollies. I'm going to fix the offensive line." It's been four years. He has not fixed it, and the team is zero and five. That many. You see that? How, how, how many fing- how many fingers are up here? Nine. Nine. That's how many wins he's had since he's taken over. Worst in the National Football League. We have nine wins on, in the Dave Gettleman era. Nine. And brutal, real- brutal stuff, fellas. Um, and really something else, which is a perfect segue, and I hate to use the word brutal because it really was uh, Dak Prescott's injury. Uh, it was a dislocated ankle uh, that, again, is, is stuff that we don't like to ever see in the National Football League, collegiate sports, professional sports, anywhere – 
in the sports spectrum because again, every single soul is a human being on this earth. And Dak Prescott is a very good one. And again, let's not forget, this is a humongous year for Dak Prescott. Why? Because he is playing, or was playing, if you will, on a franchise tag. Now he is going to be a free agent at the end of this year. And are they going to franchise tag him again? There could possibly be a chance that they do. I don't know if it will happen. I don't think it will happen. Um, unless maybe that's – he's not going. he's not going to go – this is not hockey where you're going to get a one-year deal elsewhere. You're going – and especially we don't know what quarterbacks are out there. We don't know what quarterbacks where – how much Jerry Jones can afford, how much he can put under the cap. We'll see how well Andy Dalton does. Obviously, he's not the answer, but we'll see. Maybe, uh, especially or is he? Especially no, Rob. Rob <laughs> stop it now. Stop it. Stop, <laughs> it. Stop, 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 stop it. You know why? Because now Ian could go on another segment of what really grinds my gears, and it's that answer. Uh, no, we just, need, we just need a nice big picture of, of a ginger right across the. Uh, <laughs> the, the and how many playoff wins he has in his career? It's, uh, oh man. Um, no, it's, it's, we have to see what's out there, who's out there. Uh, but I personally do, do not believe because Dak Prescott, I, he really believes in himself and believes that he can get more on the open market. And I think with that injury, uh, a dislocated ankle and especially guys, when we saw that, it almost looked like his shoe was sideways, but then, and it looked like, you know how, like when, you know, and, and Ian can, can probably attest to this because he's a father. And, you know, sometimes when you see a kid, you know, like you, you, you just, you, you shove your, you shove the foot in and then it's like, you know, okay, all right, well, the, 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 the foot is, is turned a little this way. And, you know, you're walking around like this, you know, I'm just trying to say like, you know, sure. stuff like, and that was the initial thing that I thought what happened. I was like, oh, okay. You know, nothing bad. Okay. He's just putting his, thing, his, his uh, cleat back on. And then I realized that his ankle was turned this way. And then that was when I, I, I no, but no, really disgusting stuff. He's obviously out for the season. Um, how big of an injury is this? We Guys, we know we heard it all across the league. And this is something also that Jim Nance and Tony Romo said as well uh, on the CBS broadcast that um, once a franchise quarterback goes down, and especially at the caliber of Dak Prescott, it is shockwaves throughout the NFL and tweets are there to prove that. Ian, we'll start with you. You just hope, and, and listen, I'm not a Jerry Jones fan by any stretch of the imagination, but you just hope that the Cowboys do right by Dak Prescott. Uh, listen, in last offseason, the Cowboys and Dak did everything they could to try to come to some sort of an agreement on a long-term extension. They couldn't do it. Uh, Dak thinks he deserves top five quarterback money, and he is certainly playing the season on a franchise tender like he deserves it. He has one of the – when he heads to the bench, he has one of the worst defenses in football right now playing behind him. Um, Everson Griffin, I forgot what play it was this past sun, uh, last Sunday, where they signed him to come in and be a huge piece on that defensive line, looked slow. I mean, again, Demarcus Lawrence always torches the Giants. But getting back on, on, on uh, track here with Dak Prescott, you just hope that the Cowboys do right by him. It, it was the most unfortunate injury to see, I believe, coming into the – after this past week's game, the Cowboys are still leading the NFL in total offense, and understandably so. They are just – they've been playing so well, and Dak is – every game I feel like is throwing for 400 yards and five touchdowns, and it's still never enough to win the game. I mean, he did that against Seattle and the Seahawks because the Cowboys' defense is just so porous and so banged up. They just can't stop Seattle from scoring. So they ended up losing, what, 41-40? to So you just hope – because Dak is such a class act – that Jerry Jones and the Cowboys do right by him because at this point I could see them tagging him for one more year and paying him sixteen million and see if maybe he still has it in the tank coming off a horrific injury. But I hope they give him that long term extension because right now after watching him the first five games he certainly deserves it. Deluca, your thoughts? Yeah, look, look, I'm not. I despise the Dallas Cowboys by every sen in every sense of the word, but. This was just terrible to see. I mean, this is not how I wanted to essentially beat the Cowboys, which obviously the Giants didn't end up doing anyway. But, yeah, this is a quarterback who was having a great prove-it season. 
I when I tell this guy was playing like a top five quarterback before he went down. Like, look at this point, Jerry Jones. The the power is in the hands of Jerry Jones for Dak Prescott's future because. Look at the look at the time of negotiations. I will say this: Dak Prescott was not even worth the thirty-five million a year that Jerry Jones was offering. I personally believe Dak Prescott should have taken it. And honestly, at this point, now it really look it. There's potential that it looks like he really, really should have because Jerry Jones is essentially a madman. We really do not know what this man is capable of. And I am very worried that he is not what Ian said, do right by Dak. I'm very worried he's not going to do that. I'm very worried he could go out into the draft and find someone else. This is no doubt a season-ending injury like Joey said. I'd be very surprised to see him again this season if the if Dallas even makes the playoffs, I, which at this point now, it seemed like Dallas had the division on a silver platter, especially after getting win number two. Now we don't. Now you just don't know. Now, now that once again the NFC East is wide open again, it could be anybody's division. Ser- like seriously, which is even crazier. Like if you really thought Dallas was going to run away with it, now not so much. So this is going to be a we- really interesting end to the season in the NFC East. But all the prayers to Dak Prescott, and when he comes back, whether it's with Dallas or not. I mean, I, me personally, I prefer. I I think Dak Prescott is a very good quarterback, so I would love to you know, like to root for him. So hopefully if he leaves Dallas, that wouldn't be so bad. But at the same time, let's hope he get, let's just, let's just get him back on the field. Listen, he leads, he currently leads the NFL in passing yards total with 1,856. Um, he's, he's also in top five for, uh, you know, uh, uh, yards per attempt. Um, really again, 8.4 yards per attempt, which is again, uh, an astounding number for him. Um, he, he's again, his, his passer rating is 99.6 throughout, um, throughout five total games. He's really, he's really done a fantastic job this year. And I think right now, um, they're just by looking at some of the, um, some of the players that are, on the open market for next year, there's really not a lot. Um, really, right now, what we see, we see Philip Rivers, Jacoby Brissett, Mitch Trubisky, uh, <laughs> Ryan Fitzmagic, uh, Fitzpatrick, Tyrod Taylor, AJ McCarron, Andy Dalton, Colt McCoy, Joe Flacco. Here's another one, fellas. Cam Newton as well. Cam Newton, in my opinion, guys, I think this. If Cam Newton has a, I'm going to use this big word here, and Ian's going to be very proud of me. Stupendous. I don't even know if it's. I don't even know if it goes in the sentence. Might not. I'm going to say it anyway. Depends where you go with it. A stupendous season. No, it doesn't sound right. No, it sounds okay. awful. Honestly, it doesn't, even, it doesn't matter where you went. With it. That sounds terrible. So let's go with this. If he has an amazing season, here we go. We'll just keep it at at, uh, at, at normal phonics. Um, if he has an, an amazing season, okay, uh, I would not be surprised if someone like Dallas comes calling for Cam Newton. He'd be perfect for that city. I think he would be fantastic. For not that which <laughs> obviously annoy all three of us, but nevertheless, it would not be a that, guys. He would not be. He would not be getting paid thirty-five million dollars. It saves Jerry Jones so much money. But you also have to wonder if he does have this amazing season. Who's to say New England just doesn't bring him? Agreed. Back? Lock him up. Yeah. yeah why, why not? Oh, we have to go back. Even not even lock up. Just like two, th- two more years. Three that, more years. That's possible. But the whole thing though is, is we have to remember, is that New England does not spend that much money. New England is known for that, where they always get these guys on on hometown contracts. Let me just say, Stephon Gilmore, Stephon Gilmore is making twenty five million. I'll get back to you in a second, Deluca. Joe Thune with fourteen million dollars. Um, again, Patrick Chung, who is or who was making, I think, or in the range of like eight or nine million dollars on the open market. Patrick Chung would be worth a lot more money. 
The same thing goes with Donta Hightower. Um, so I think just by looking at at that, it's really it, it we'll see how much or how far Bill Belichick says it, again if they if they do really well because right now this team is not supposed to win the AFC East. They're not supposed to. It's supposed to be ran, the Bills were supposed to run away with it. Mm. Right then lost, then they, but then they lost. And yeah, they not lost. only did they, guys, not only did they lose, the Bills' defense looks horrid. Yeah. Horrid. Yeah. Tredavious White may have been a flash in the pan. Josh Norman got stiff armed so badly that he was picked up by Derrick Henry. Okay. So, and that was, <laughs> that was surprisingly Tuesday night football. Yeah, guys, Tuesday night football. What are we in Canada? CFL? No. This is the NFL today. Tuesday night. Thanks, COVID. We played on Tuesday. That's right. Bill's last, Chiefs, baby. Bill's last, Chiefs. last time we played on Tuesday, 2010, Eagles Blizzard game. Wow. That's right. I remember that game. I remember watching it on a Tuesday, and I remember saying, oh, this is weird. <laughs> guys, I personally believe that Dak Prescott could potentially do that. But again, if Jerry Jones wants to take a run at Cam Newton, if he has a great season, I do not see it, especially with Jerry Jones. He could do that. But again, we can also see what he's done with Jason Garrett, where he's given him nine lives. So who knows? Maybe he Joey, might say. Yeah. But Joey, now think about this. Say, say that's what Jerry Jones does. Who is to say Bill Belichick doesn't swing it back around and get Dak? It certainly would make a it's lot a Bill of sense. I, I mean, it, what would what, what would seem most realistic is that Dak will be retained in Dallas and Cam will be retained in New England. It, it just makes too much sense. If they if New England felt, and I know Patriots fans have been clamoring for him, if they feel that Jared Stidham was the guy, I feel that they would have gone to him. They, either they felt he's not ready or whatever the case may be. The rumor right now is he's injured. That's why they haven't gotten – that's why they didn't go – Whatever it may be, it, it's just that the – you have Cam Newton who, again, talking about rejuvenating his career after oh, yeah. injury upon injury upon injury, doing pretty well for, for, for New England right now. So if you've got a guy who can still run the football, still throw the ball as well as he can, why and, – and to Rob's point, why wouldn't you give him two or three years? And why in the world is that, you know, you mentioned the quarterbacks on the market at the end of this year, Joey. Why in the world would Dallas want any of them? Right. Because why would any, Why would they want to even give up on Dak unless he suffers this – unless this injury results in him playing so poorly going forward. Then you know what? You take the one year with him and then maybe it's like, all right, maybe we should look start looking to invest yeah. in a quarterback come 2022. But – both teams enjoy. You have said, lines said, to have great careers with their teams. I don't understand why yeah. either of them would let them walk. Yeah, and Joe, you said Joe Flacco, like the Jets obviously aren't going to extend him for seven more years. And <laughs> you call the answer for Darnold. Like, yeah, maybe Sam Darnold will go to Dallas. That'll be <laughs> <laughs> that might actually, for the first time ever, have Jerry Jones on the chopping block <laughs> of his own team, of his own yeah, right. right? Well, Sam will call for the head. Listen, it's not out of the woods, okay, because we saw also, let's not forget, we also do not know what's going to happen with the Jets, and this all comes back to the Jets. You have to realize something, guys. There were talks that the Jets may not be able to get a first or second round pick for Sam Donald. Again, if Dak Prescott costs too much money, and when Ian and Rob both said, guys that are watching out here, says that, well, if Jerry Jones does right by his quarterback, by his franchise quarterback, okay, no problem. But then you also need some sort of pull, not pull, but leverage. Not, I don't want to say leverage, but give and take, if you will. Sure. And I think, guys, that if Dak Prescott doesn't do that, he's going to be sent walking. He needs to understand that this injury we have not seen, this type of injury, we have not seen in the NFL since Alex Smith, okay? And we'll get to that in just a minute with, with him making his emotional return in Washington with the Washington football team. Um, but in all, uh, in all, in all uh, seriousness, why can't we see – sorry about that, guys. Why can't we see a trade for Sam Donald? 
listen, we saw it with Ryan Tannehill going from Miami to Tennessee in a free agent move. We saw how Ryan Tannehill got a big payday, and he's now the franchise quarterback in Tennessee. Why can't we see Jerry Jones say, okay, you know what? I might take a flyer and say, all right, let's, let's, let's trade for a Sam Darnold if he costs too much money, maybe $35, $36 million. Listen, we don't know what's going to happen, but the way the negotiations went before last season or before this season, if you will, before all COVID and everything hit, yeah, there is a lot of possibilities out there, and that includes some guys that, again, eventually – goes back to the Jets, and it always goes back back to the Jets, it seems. Everything is possible, and I think everything is on the table, even though that, again, the, the your both of your comments both make sense, obviously. Um, but let's keep moving forward. Uh, the Tennessee Titans, are, are they're rolling following the outbreak. We said this earlier. Um, Derrick Henry, he, he, made, he made him – he bled by Derrick Henry, made the Buffalo Bills look silly. Uh, Ian, your thoughts on on the on the Titans? Are are they are they the real deal or no? Or are the Bills not the real deal? What do we know here? I'm going to focus on the Tennessee end. I'm going to say they're not the real deal yet. Uh, well, it's hard not to say that they're not just because of how far they got last year. But right now, the most valuable player on the Tennessee Titans is Steven Gaskowski. <laughs> I mean, after he missed that chip shot field goal week one against Denver. He has been responsible for three of the game of, of their four wins so far because he's kicked a game winning field goal with either his time has expired or in the final couple of minutes, in the final two minutes. The good thing for Tennessee is right now, their numbers are very Jekyll and Hyde offensively. If you look at them statistically, I believe they are top 15. So at least they're top half in the league in terms of the offensive categories, the most consistent player, in all honesty, for the Titans, has actually been Ryan Tannehill. So I guess if, if if you want to look at a big bright spot is the fact that the most important player in the most important position in the most in, in, in that respective sport is performing the best on that franchise. So I guess that is the, the best way to look at it. Derrick Henry, he's a monster, but I mean, his numbers, if you look at it week to week, have not been consistent. One week he went 23 for 87. This past week he went for over 100 and a touchdown. So – you know Derrick Henry is going to give you the numbers that you need to, but every week it's been a different player picking up the slack. But I don't think they're performing offensively in a groove where you would say, wow, this team should really beat Kansas City, even though they probably should have in the AFC Championship game last year considering the lead. Or maybe they should beat New England, or maybe they should, you know, or maybe they should beat Baltimore. I, I don't know what we're discussing at this point with regards to – with Tennessee, I just think they're not consistent enough right now to say I'm putting them, even though Mike, they've got the right coach at the helm with Mike Vrabel, I'm not sure I'm exactly ready yet to put them in the Super Bowl. That's definitely fair. Um, and, again, you look at their 4-0. They're going up against uh, the, the Houston Texans that are 1-4. Rob DeLuca, your thoughts. Uh, Tennessee, uh, again, I'm going to ask you the same question. Are they the real deal, or is Buffalo a fake four and zero? Well, for, well, uh, four, oh, and one now. four and one, four and one now. But yeah, since Ian took the Tennessee tide, I'll go to the Buffalo side. Keep it, keep it a little, uh, keep it now, yeah. <laughs> interesting. I get, I get the boring side of things, but no, no, look, Buffalo is a very, very good team. There's a reason they were picked as potential favorites for the AFC East. Mainly, well, I mean that, and that that they're a good team, and the fact that New England is severely weaker than they were just a year ago. But look, the Bills seem like they have the weapons. But look, Tennessee's a good team, so I I would not write the Bills off off of this game yet, especially because of how much time off Tennessee had. You had to know they were going to come out on this Tuesday night football game hungry, and boy, did they! So you just got to think that the Buffalo Bills, you know, you look – well, let's, their, let's take a look at their next game. What, what, their next game is against whom? I'm trying to see here. Oh, oh, Kansas City. Monday night. Five Monday night against Kansas City. Look, that, there's a big, big old litmus test there and for the Buffalo Bills. That might be able to tell us. Look, do I, th I think the Chiefs are going to win the game. Let's, let me not be – stupid here the Chiefs are probably going to win the game they're just that much they are just that much better of a team they are just that much of a force even though the game is in Buffalo but nevertheless it doesn't really matter nowadays yeah exactly right now it doesn't matter 
So, like, but had it been in Kansas City, there would be fans. It would be that much harder. But that's true. But, and we know, yeah, and not great. only that, and just to interrupt you for a second, we know how loud 17,500 fans really sound in a, in a stadium that has a capacity of almost 80,000. So, right. Rob DeLuga, go ahead. And how much they can make an impact. Oh, 100%. Oh, number yeah. one. So in, Buffalo, so in Buffalo, so there's no fans, but still, this it, it still helps. It's your turf, you know. It's, it's your surroundings. You just you just get a mental mental edge there. But yeah, no, look, this is the big test. Two four and one teams. We will see what happens. It, Chiefs are favored by five. That is a very interesting spread. I think if the Bills can keep it around there, keep it within the spread, even be, even cover it. Then, then I would say don't definitely don't write them off yet. Like I said, I expect the Chiefs to win, but I also like just the way the Buffalo Bills have performed so far. Do I think Josh Allen is a, a great quarterback? Remains to be seen. He's still got a lot of question marks on him. But mark my words, this game on Monday night, I, or I'm excuse me, Monday evening, five. It's a five p.m. start. Because again, thanks COVID. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love these. Mo- I love the Monday night doubleheaders. Who doesn't? <laughs> Who doesn't love more football on, on days? On on all these days, it's going to be very close. It's going to be a great game to watch. Yeah, I- it really is. It it really is going to be a, a fun game to watch and to see what the deal is with them. Is uh, uh, you, you know the way that the the Pagulas have done with the Buffalo franchises. Uh, they've really, and you know what, I hate to say it, but especially with Ian being a Rangers fan, um, you know, James Dolan has kept his hands out of the New York Rangers. And I like to use that that analogy because the Pegulas are very similar to Dolan, where Dolan has had his hands all over the New York Knicks, has not so much had his hands all over the New York Rangers, and we have seen – so much better results. Well, the same goes for the Pegulas up in Western New York, where they don't really touch the Buffalo Bills, but they have their hands all over the Buffalo Sabres. All over the Buffalo Sabres. And we know how bad they are. And not going to be better this year. But, but well, yeah, but we'll we'll get back to that in a minute. But the reason why we brought that up is because the Buffalo Bills were supposed to be Really good. Well, right now they're ranked 27th in rushing. Uh, their defense is okay, 19th. Not great, less than half. Uh, they're ranked second in passing. Number three is um, the Chiefs. And there's two top five offenses going at it here, guys. And I think that what we might see on Monday is a shootout. And I would not be surprised because, again, Stephon Diggs, Tyreek Hill, John Brown, Cole Beasley, guys, who has done a phenomenal job since he has come over from Dallas, ranked two and four respectively. Uh, Number two, the Chiefs. Number four, the Buffalo Bills. Last time these two teams met, the Bills won 16-10, November 26, 2017, the first time will be this Sunday, or excuse me, this Monday, where both Mahomes and Allen meet up. Um, Well, that's what I was going to say. I slightly disagree with Rob with regards to the Josh Allen remark. Yeah, I I think he's finally been put in a situation where he has a number one wide receiver, where he hasn't, you know, where – listen, when he – coming out of the combine, Josh Allen was actually my favorite quarterback in that draft. From the combine, I thought he had the strongest arm. Yeah, over Darnold, over Baker, certainly over. There weren't, lot, there weren't a lot of primitive options here in this. Well, no, but you know what? There were plenty of people. Who, you know, Ian, you, there were not. I'm sorry to interrupt you. There were not many people who thought that Josh Allen was going to be the guy. No, right. and 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 why is that? Because the three other quarterbacks that got drafted, aside from Josh Allen, all came from Power Five schools. Josh Allen came from Wyoming. It's 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 like the Carson Wentz approach. Like they drafted Carson Wentz because they knew the talent was there with the Eagles, uh, but he came out of a Division One FCS school in North Dakota State. Same thing here. Like Josh Allen came from Wyoming. Not many people, you know, hold Wyoming in the Mountain West up to this high standard like they do a Power Five conference. So, right. you know, he, Sam Darnold's going up against UCLA and Oregon, and 
Josh Allen's going up against Fresno State and UNLV. Like, so it's like the, the, the level of competition is different. Just looking at, at him in the combine, his arm strength, just so strong, and you see it every week. I love the way Josh Allen's been playing this year. He's still very fumble-prone. There's no doubt about that. But just on athleticism alone, I, to me, he's not going to win the award by any means. But I think right now he belongs top five in the MVP conversation. Okay. I mean, yeah, look, I, look yeah, I, look, I, I, he's having a good year. There's no, there's no doubting this. But I just think there's a lot of question marks because, like, but yes, the 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 key thing was is he finally got some weapons and he's finally able to like utilize his skill. So we will see how this pays off in the long run. And like I said, especially after the poor showing they had on Tuesday, I think Mon- Monday evening is going to bring is going to be the essentially the could be the real test here. If they keep it a close game, even maybe win the game, then yeah. They win the game, then yes, they're the real deal. That's not even a question. You beat the Chiefs. I don't care where you're playing that football game. You beat the Kansas City Chiefs, and even though they're giving they're giving up twenty points a game, which is you know decent, but still, you beat the Kansas City Chiefs. You're definitely the real deal. You keep it close. You shouldn't be written off yet, though. Well, just to look back at what Ian was saying, where Josh Allen was selected number seven out of Wyoming in the Mountain West, that deal, mind you. That was a deal uh, from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers where they, uh, where the Bills moved up for Josh Allen. Why? Because they did not want Arizona to take him at number 10 that year. Well, guess what? The Arizona Cardinals were left off with Josh Rosen, who is now uh, on the street. Okay? So yeah. now Josh Allen, out of the three guys – or excuse me, out of the two guys, they were supposed to be – I remember I remember that that whole year when um, that was following the Eagles Super Bowl win. Uh, it was Baker Mayfield. It was Sam Darnold. It was Josh Allen. It was Josh Rosen. But do not forget, ladies Lamar and gentlemen. Lamar Jackson. Ah, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's very funny. Who else was there? Lamar Who Jackson. Later traded back – into the first round to go get God, I love Ozzy Newsome. Can, can we bring him to New the Giants to be the GM? That's please, it. Please, please, you know, I love him. I think he's the he's the best general manager in all in all of the NFL. You know, because or, then, because then you look at obviously there was a significant dip when it came to quarterbacks uh, in the in the rest of the draft because it was the Kyle Lawletta show for the Giants. Uh, it was, again, as we said, Lamar Jackson picked at number 32. They traded with the, uh, the then Super Bowl winning champion Eagles that year when they held the number 32 pick. Um, so, uh, again, there's just – there's so many questions when um, – you know, I think uh, you know what I think. You guys said it. I think Josh Allen. I think he was a very good pick, and uh, and, and you know, I don't want to keep going back to so far back, but in terms of this upcoming week, they really made a great a, a great pick, and he's really he's really coming to his own. But now that defense just has to be shored up a bit, and I know that there are some guys that that opted out of this year, both on the defensive side. Uh, Lorenzo Alexander also retired uh, this past year as well. Um, he was the, uh, the, the leader of that linebacking core and really that defense for, uh, for the Buffalo Bills. So again, a, a lot of, a lot of talk where Josh Allen, is he, is he the real deal? Do we know yet? I really do believe that the Buffalo Bills are there and I don't want to use that COVID as a, uh, as an excuse because you know what? It's next man up and that's the way it should be. Um, and I really do believe that the Bills are um, ready to go. And I wouldn't be surprised, guys. I would not be surprised if the Bills beat the Chiefs. I really would not. I would not be surprised at all. I could see it happening. They, I, I wouldn't. It wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. I'll say that. Much. They, they lost to Las Vegas badly. And okay, guys, it could be a slip up. It, it didn't look good. It didn't also, look also remember that was a game. Yeah, that's really terrible. Really... Offense scores thirty two points. You're supposed to win. You're supposed to win when your offense scores thirty two points. Plain and simple. Yeah, but also remember the Raiders needed that game badly. I mean, listen, yeah. I'm not trying to say it's a statement win because they went out and they beat Mahomes and 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 they ended up improving to three and two. The Raiders were coming off two really bad weeks, 
two after two really good weeks where after week two, I remember the three of us were on the show talking about are the Raiders for real, and we said it was going to depend on how they performed over the next four to five weeks. Look, I, I don't think the Raiders are anywhere close to using the word real, but yeah. wow. I mean, talk about a game they needed. Really true, they performed. Defensively, it was a high-scoring affair, but, man, did they come up with the stops when they needed them in the fourth quarter. Guys, the – the Atlanta Falcons lost their fifth straight game, and uh, they let go. Their general manager, Arthur head co- uh, owner Arthur Blank, let go his general manager, Thomas Dimitrov, and his uh, head coach, Dan Quinn. Mm-hmm. Guys? That's right. Uh, it's about time, is it not? I mean, and on top of it now, this is something that we need to discuss as well. Arthur Blank has come out publicly and said, he cannot commit to Matt Ryan as the future of the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> <laughs> Why? The Atlanta Falcons are having a fantastic year on offense. It's true. Joey, I mean, look, they, they, they really are having a fantastic year on offense. Like Matt Ryan is playing some great football here. And most of it has been without his Lord and Savior, or well, Falcons fans, Lord and Savior, Julio Jones. So that even proves it more that he is just a really good quarterback. Is he getting up there in age? Sure. He's 35 years old. But as we've seen, quarterbacks that don't get hit often can stay around longer because they're just, especially when they're mobile, they're just good. He's a very good quarterback. But the defense on this team, the defense and what was, thank God for the Atlanta Falcons fans, what was the coaching and leadership of this team, it's finally over for them. They finally taste some relief. I cannot believe that the owner came out and said that he can't commit to them right now. So that – and with – Atlanta now at 0-5, you have to look at them in the top couple picks on what they'll do in the draft. You just don't know anymore. But I personally believe if this is true, that Matt Ryan is not going to be an Atlanta Falcon next year, wherever he goes, he'll make them pay. If, if obviously, he goes to a team that plays the Falcons, he'd make them pay. I, I don't know about that, Rob. I mean – the problem is, is whenever a, fo- a team struggles, especially in the National Football League, is it always falls back on two people. For every franchise in the yep, league. It falls on the general manager and it falls on the starting quarterback. Because the most popular player on every National Football League team is always the backup QB. It's always how it happens. We bring in the backup. The backup could be the worst quarterback in football. Somehow he's going to find a way to score 30 points and he doesn't even do that. <laughs> it, it, it's true. The most popular player in the NFL is always the backup quarterback. But You're not wrong. Uh, you, you, I think you, the problem, you say that, though. And I think that's why – Arthur Blank is is going back to Matt and saying, I don't know if we can commit. They're 0-5. That's the problem. Like I said, it yeah. always falls back on the GM. It always falls back on the starting quarterback. Rob's right. He's 35 years old, but with a, with a stable offensive line, you could hang around a little bit longer. Somehow Tom Brady still manages to hang around five years older than Matt Ryan is at this point. This is the Falcons' first 0-5 start since 1997. Think about how long that's been, 23 years since they've actually started 0-5. You're going back to the days of, what, Chris Chandler? Wow. Back to the Atlanta Falcons in 1997. So the Dan Reeves, the start of the Dan Reeves. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're, we're going back a little bit, but um, I don't know if Matt Ryan's going anywhere. Uh, we'll see. I, I know he. I think he's only saying that simply because of the draft position that they're in. Yeah. However, but- however, they've got the Vikings on tap this weekend. They're going to be without Dalvin Cook. I know Alexander Madison is a solid number two option at running back, and there's a lot to like about him. And yeah. He just, Hits the he just hits the gap so hard when he runs the football reminds me a lot of Dalvin Cook, but I think it's it's it is a very winnable game for the Falcons this weekend. Uh, now, Joey, you you you're looking at Ian here saying he's showing his age, bringing that up. You're the one that pulled out Kyle La Letter just a couple minutes ago. From the <laughs> after no one asked to ever have that name brought up. Okay, like no one needs those memories. <laughs> That's what we can call them. Well, you know, it, it's it's crazy because you look at some of the defensive numbers here for the Atlanta Falcons. They have given up the second most yardage 
in all of football, 1,679 total yards through five games. That's a lot. That is a lot. And there's one team that's that's given up more, and that's the Seattle Seahawks, but they actually have a good excuse, and that's Russell Wilson. Not saying that Matt Ryan isn't good, but – there are certain things that clearly it just comes down to the to the nigga things that it's just it's Russell Wilson time and he comes in the clutch. Now again, not saying that Matt Ryan doesn't, but uh, there are things that just bad luck at at, at some points. Uh, it doesn't happen, and then they've also given up a league high. They're tied for dead last with the New Orleans Saints with 15 touchdowns uh, given up. It, it's brutal. Not only that, also. Opposing quarterback rating is at a league worst, 118.3. It is bad. You can't get any worse than what it is here. And they've also given up a league worst 25 passes that are 20 yards or more. Joey, I I don't know if you have it pulled up in front of you. But can you just by looking at the backs, there are three linebackers and there are four starting players in the secondary. Can you name, tell me if any of those seven starters is even anything close to resembling, not even so much a pro bowler, but a serviceable player at their position in the NFL? No, I don't think so. And just right. by and so just you wonder by, why they're opposing QBR is like a one eighteen. That is right. like and, and just by and just by looking at the uh the linebackers, they they really ever since they lost uh or let go. Um, uh, uh, my, my, uh, I'm losing it here. Um, from, uh, Beasley? Now. you thinking of Vic Beasley or yeah, who you Vic Beasley? I'm thinking of, yes, Vic Beasley ever since then. And again, he really wasn't great towards the latter part of his career no. uh, in, in Atlanta, but he started off decent. He played great in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, again, another flash in the pan draft pick that really did not work out for Dimitrov. But again, the linebackers, uh, the they really they they lost a lot on the defensive side of the ball, and uh, they they really they, they don't have it. They they don't have it, and I think you can only do so much with guys like Takaris McKean wow. and Dante Fowler. Uh, and then you have Darquise Denard uh, in 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 the in the uh, in the secondary. JJ Wilcox, who was completely overrated from his time, um, I think in uh, where, where was he in uh, in Arizona? I think he was. He was there. or He was in Dallas. Uh, no, uh, well, I, he, was in Dallas. Dallas. he was in Dallas. He was in Arizona. Yeah, he was in Dallas, and then he was, and then he was with Pittsburgh, and then Indianapolis, and then Atlanta. Correct. Yeah. So. Um, Again, when he was with when he was with Dallas, in my opinion, the guy was overrated, and that's that. Those are their best defensive backs. They're in, they need a whole rebuild on the defensive side of the ball, and uh, you might have to part ways with uh, guys like Julio Jones or potentially a Calvin Ridley. I think you're going to want to build around a Calvin Ridley, but sure. uh, you're probably going to have to part ways with a Julio Jones in order to get back good draft capital. Hate to say it, guys, but uh, the Atlanta Falcons are in for a rebuild and will most likely be on the bottom below the Carolina Panthers. Yes, that's another bold statement there. Um, guys, we got some baseball here. The Fall Classic is uh, is less than five days away. Tuesday night is game number one of the World Series. Right now, the, uh, the Houston Astros have come back from three games to none, and uh, they're looking at a game six tonight. Uh, and then also the Los Angeles Dodgers, they are looking, I'm going to say, a mess. And I think that uh, they are not only a hot mess, but also Clayton Kershaw had a flash-in-the-pan type year when uh, they went to the World Series a couple of years ago. They fell to the uh, to the Astros. But ever since Clayton Kershaw had a pretty good outing that that one playoff year, he has come back to reality, and now we are starting to see regular season Clayton Kershaw. Now those words come back into effect, and postseason Clayton Kershaw looking like a dumpster fire. The problem with the the LA Dodgers, and and this is why I didn't write them off after Game Two, is that they ran into the best one-two punch in a rotation in the postseason this season. Max Fried and Ian Anderson. I'm not sure exactly what their combined stats are, but they have been as better than advertised. I mean, remember, what, what the Braves lost Mike Soroka. 
an NL Rookie of the Year candidate last year, what, a week and a half into the season? So they were depending on Max Fried, who was a, I believe, a four-star for the yeah. last year. Ian Anderson's a rookie. And they have come out and and served at, in terms of short series. Remember, the wild card series was the best of three. The National League Division Series was the best of five. And came out and just wiped the floor with, with the Reds and the and the Miami Marlins. They came out and they, they, they just set the tone for both those series. And it, the same thing happened in this series against the Dodgers. The only reason I didn't um, – you know, kind of count them out of this series that is Los Angeles is because after Freed and Anderson, they're a little lacking in, in the rotation behind those top two. And with no days off in either series, the ALCS or the NLCS, because as Joey mentioned, Game 1 of the World Series is on Tuesday, um, you're going to have a lot of fatigued arms in that bullpen. So they come out, they put up 11 runs in the first inning yesterday. And when the and when game three 15 to two and you're like we're gonna throw we're putting Kershaw on the bump in game four there's no reason we shouldn't have this series even lest we forget Clayton Kershaw is one of the biggest postseason heels as a Cy Young and MVP candidate in baseball history his record in the postseason career wise is 11 and 12 with an ERA of 4.31 how many Cy Youngs has this guy won <laughs> I, I, I've lost count. Credit to him that he actually had five strong innings last night until the sixth when things blew up. I mean, he gave up that home run to Ozuna in, the, in I think it was the fourth or the fifth. They were only down one nothing, And then in the sixth inning, it just all blew up. And then the final score ends up being 10-2. to two. So the Dodgers are really in tough shape right now. The problem is, is there's a game five coming tonight. Even if the Dodgers do win game five, now you've got a rested Max Fried, a rested Ian Anderson on on full rest going for game six and game seven, respectively. So, yeah, the Dodgers are in a lot of trouble. Max Fried during the regular season, guys, was 7-0 and with a 2.25 ERA in a total game started, 56 innings pitched, 14 earned runs allowed, 50 strikeouts, and his opposing batting average was 2-11. Rob DeLuca, your thoughts on uh, postseason baseball, the AL and the NLCS? Well, yeah, okay. So the ALCS, it's uh, game six tonight, currently one to nothing Tampa Bay over the Houston Astros in the fifth inning. So if obviously still very early, it's only the fifth inning. But yeah, as all three of us did take the Tampa Bay Rays in, a, in our picks pool. So it's, it's very intriguing, very, very close. Well, between me and Ian. <laughs> hey, I heard that was only a game behind us, but the problem is we all took the same four teams. Yeah, we, 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 we the same team in the National League. Yeah, <laughs> so we got the same done. here, and it looks like we're, we. And based on the way things are going, it looks like we're going to get burned on the NLCS side. We are going to get badly burned here because the Dodgers. It just seemed like they were not ready for the Braves. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Braves come out swinging. And as as our graphic gets pulled there, I had Dodgers in five. What a giant whoops that was! <laughs> <laughs> and then meanwhile, I've got Tampa in seven, which could still theoretically happen. I would honestly prefer it ends in six tonight, but we will see what happens as the game goes on. Still one nothing. So, but yeah, I just think that the Braves have set themselves up being up three one was absolutely huge because, mm -hmm. as I said, even if the Dodgers win, their two best pitchers are on full rest for game six and, if needed, a game seven. So it's they're really set up beautifully. Like They could, they, they literally can just screw around with their bullpen tonight and yep. it'd be okay. There's not going to be too much of an issue. So it's very interesting to see, to think that at the start of this pandemic season, that we were talking about possibly the Atlanta Braves and the Tampa Bay Rays, you know, obviously just based on the way the current situation is now in, in this exact moment of time, we're talking about the Tampa Bay Rays and Atlanta Braves winning their respective pennants. I do not think a single soul saw that coming. No. And if there is, I want to meet them and learn their ways because that I could make more money betting that way. Well, what the Tampa Bay Rays need tonight, and they've gotten so far through five innings, is they need Blake Snell to be a gamer. They need Blake Snell to be the AL Cy Young Award winner that he was named only a couple of years ago. Yes. He has, was not it during the regular season. He was not it last year in 2019. They need him to be a gamer. So far right now, he 
let's be real for a second. Let, let's be real for a second. He wasn't it last week against the Yankees. Right. Yeah. Like, he, right. Two weeks ago. I mean, so far, four innings pitch. Yeah. I'm sorry. They're, they're only through four, four innings. I apologize. But four innings pitch, three hits. Yes. No runs, four walks. I mean, that's not that's great. That's the big smell they need. We, four strikeouts. But they need him to. Yeah. As recently as to go against the Yankees, he was not the Blake Snell that they know. Right no. now, right this second, he is. But, like, and that, that has to maintain for at least two more innings. At like right now, a two out RBI by Willie Adamas in the second inning is the difference in this one nothing game so far. Right. Uh, there's only been one guy right now in the Tampa Bay starting lineup in this series that is hitting oh, not even over 300, who's hitting over 250. That's Randy Arozarena, who's been the hottest. Yeah, but yeah, right now in, in the postseason. If they give out an MVP for an entire postseason, it has to go to Randy Arozarena. I have no clue. Who Randy Arozarena was? I even said that during, I I tweeted that out during the series against the Yankees. I said I had no clue who is Randy Arozarena. I don't know who this was. But I'll tell you what. At the I end of the series, I heard of him. He was, he was batting five twenty by the end of the series against the Yankees. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, the Rays have been awfully resilient. I mean, entering tonight, they actually trailed in all but one game in this series, which was Game Two. All, in all but one game. So think about how last night G-Man Choi comes up down a run, and if not for the Carlos Correa home run in the bottom of the ninth, maybe the Rays win it last night. But, man, are the, are the Rays getting the – not excuse me, the Astros are getting the right performances at the right time. Their starting pitching has been good enough. Granke was solid yesterday. Their game four was a bullpen game. Solid. Altuve's hitting over 400 yeah. in this series. Correa – is finding that big hit again. So George Springer, man, do I want him to be a Met in 2020? Uh, excuse me, 2021. I mean, the, the third of that lineup, Springer, Brantley, Altuve, have been phenomenal for the Astros. The oh, yeah. Year, not the, I'll beat the whole series. So this is the game, getting back on point with the, with the Rays, this is the game that Blake Snell needs to have. He needs to be a gamer. He needs to go out there and give his team six, seven strong innings. Yep. Set everything up for that solid bullpen that they have, especially with Diego Castillo to come in and shut the door. And because if this game, if this thing goes to a game seven tomorrow night, we could be talking 2004 Red Sox all over. I was just gonna say that I did not want to say it. the baseball world. Does not, the baseball world do, world does not need another 2004 ALCS. They they don't need shades of that. They don't need any of it. None of it. Believe me, nobody wants to see it. Nobody except for Astros fans are actually rooting for the Astros. And I speak for Yankee fans just based on what I see. No, literally everybody except Houston Astro fans are rooting for the Tampa Bay Rays. to 100%. 100%. I know Joey's certainly one of them. <laughs> I am not rooting for the Houston Astros. Well, that I know. That's why I, am I'm rooting for, I am rooting for the Tampa Bay Rays very hard. And if it was Tampa versus Atlanta in the World Series, I would be rooting for Atlanta very hard. Oh, of course. Oh yeah, no. My my fandom for the Tampa Bay Rays ends if they can as soon as this series is over. <laughs> this series is over, that fandom ends. I'd honestly, even as a Mets fan, be happy with either of those teams, just because like, uh, and I know it's like, wow, Ian, a Met fan, I'm gonna root for the Braves. I, I think it's just gonna be. It would be a great series, even though I picked the Dodgers um, to win. And why wouldn't I? Who wouldn't? I mean, I, I thought yeah. that the Braves yeah. really yeah. hadn't run in. Pick the Braves. Show me no. some. Listen, I listen. I was the only one of the four of us that picked the Braves over the Reds first and yep. foremost. So let's let's discuss that. <laughs> I didn't think I thought the Braves were coming off series against two teams that really could not hit. They were running into a potent lineup. Go figure. After uh, you know Freed and Anderson pitched, they put up 15 runs in Game Three. Game Four, Kershaw stinks it up. They lose 10-2. So I mean, the series is not over yet. I mean, in theory, you do have Walker Bueller waiting if Dustin May. I mean, Dustin May throws real hard. I mean, he's a he, I mean, the guy hits the triple digits consistently. But the Braves are playing such good baseball right now. It, it's hard to dispute the fact that they may not even that they may close out the series tonight. Again, as we were discussing earlier, Clayton Kershaw, uh, eleven and twelve, uh, his postseason record. He's not good in the postseason. No. The Dodgers, I do not believe, will ever win a World Series with him. Sorry, uh, the, one second, Joey. The Houston Astros just went ahead of the race, two to one, in the top of the fifth. <laughs> so, please continue. Now, I apologize. Now, let's I apologize see, let's ask the question: Did I do that? <laughs> Rob Deluca, are you going to say the magic words? No. 
Good. Not until it actually happens. <laughs> I'm convinced I did that. I'm convinced I just broke the raise just now. Just Love by, talking, by uh, just by talking George about Singer. them in a positive light, I broke them. Just for being a nice person and actually giving the race credit, I might have broken them. I apologize, Tampa Bay. The Atlanta Braves, let's not forget, guys, um, mm. they were not supposed to have Nick Markakis this year. They were also not supposed to have uh, – excuse me, the Tampa Bay Rays were not supposed to have Blake Snell this year either because both of them – were supposed to opt out of the season because of COVID. Blake Snell was one of the more vocal players in terms of money, ownership fight, etc. So that was the deal. And now both of these players are playing a humongous role in their team's success, where Blake Snell is was just actually taken out of the game. But – with be that as it may, I think it's really amazing to see these two guys that once said we're not going to play this year due to COVID are now on a team. Oh, they are now both in their respective league championship series. Really, really cool stuff. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's really cool to see the Braves move forward because we have not seen the Braves do anything, anything. Since the Bobby Cox, Chipper Jones days, we have not seen the Andrew Jones days. We have not seen any of that in a long time. We thought Freddie Gonzalez was the answer once he was fired from the Florida Marlins. Yes, the Florida Marlins. Not, or was he with the Miami Marlins? No, he was Florida. He was Florida. It was Florida, yes. It was before. We're showing our age. We're really showing our age, Joey. Sorry? We're really showing our age here, Joe. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. Well, he was also hired, and then eventually Brian Snicker was uh, was brought in there. So um, crazy stuff there. But, again, it's really amazing to see the deal where these players, once opted out, are now back in and showing what they are worth in their respective uh, for their respective teams in their uh, LCS games or series, if you will. Guys, let's conclude this. Kudos to Las Vegas and the T-Mobile Arena on getting first ever hosting rights, uh, whoever wrote that in here, uh, I think I think we need a little bit of Grammarly here, uh, on getting their first ever uh, hosting rights for the NCAA Division One tournament in 2023. Who was that that wrote that? That was, was that me. You? That was you. That was me. Come on. Oh, okay. Maybe then you know what? Maybe it's what, me. What I did know. I say about that? That was what? What did I write in there that I, that was wrong? Vegas on getting. Oh, okay. All right, my bad. So you see, it was me. Sorry, I apologize. I apologize. Under the bus, Joey, like always. I see. I'm, we were so close. <laughs> we were right at the end. Oh, listen, listen here. You know what? Here, here. This is this is me now. I, I'm sorry. I, I I apologize. Just me, just trash. Um. Okay. I I just, I just can't read today. Uh. The Vegas. Yeah. T-Mobile Arena getting their first ever um, NCAA Division I tournament 2023. Really cool stuff also that we just saw a couple of days ago. Um, all of the uh, the sites for between 2022 and I believe 2026, mm -hmm. which is really cool. The most prominent ones that are close by here and especially in the Big East family. Uh, St. John's and the Big East will be hosting uh, the Eastern Regional in 2023 at Madison Square Garden. 2025, the Big East and Seton Hall will be hosting the 2025 Eastern Regional. That will be very cool as well. And again, this upcoming year, folks, Brooklyn has the uh, Eastern Regional. That's going to be at the Barclays Center, hosted by the Atlantic 10. And also, for those on the East Coast as well, Providence and the Big East will be hosting round number one and two up at the Dunkin' Donuts Center. And for those that have never been up to the dunk, it is a really, really cool place. And if you know what the uh, the ins and outs of the uh, of the Nassau Coliseum looks like, it's pretty much that. Uh, so really, really cool stuff there. Uh, also, kudos to the Los Angeles Lakers on winning uh, their 17th uh, NBA championship. LeBron James, uh, Anthony Davis. Uh, Avery Bradley will not be getting a, uh, a ring because he opted out and, uh, which is, which is really something else, but you know, we don't have a lot of time for that, but, uh, and also let's not forget too, this is, this is something fantastic too. Uh, Jeannie Buss becomes the first female, uh, NBA owner 
to ever win a championship, to win the trophy. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and now with her with her doing that and fo- fo- excuse me, following her father's footsteps and the boss and uh, and 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 uh, and Dr. Jerry Buss, uh, his footsteps and being basketball's version of George Steinbrenner. Um, really, really cool stuff to see. And uh, kudos to the LA Lakers on winning championship number seventeen and ties now with their uh, arch rival, the Boston Celtics. So that is going to be a fun, fun thing moving forward with the Celtics and. Uh, the Lakers moving forward, and that would be pretty cool if we see another uh, Lakers Celtics uh, NBA championship. Because who knows? That could be that would be the tiebreaker on uh, you know who wins number eighteen. Really cool stuff. And again, uh, seventeen for both of them is the uh, is the most in NBA history. By the way, for those that do not know, um, guys, let's close this up here. Ian Schreier next Thursday. We've got a little uh, little interview here uh, mm-hmm. that includes Ian Schreier. Ladies and gentlemen, for those that are wondering why I'm going to be interviewing Ian Schreier, because why not? We interviewed Rob DeLuca many, many episodes ago on the uh, Primetime Rundown interview series powered by StreamYard. So we're going to be doing that with Ian Schreier. But we are not going to say there's a little bit of a surprise there uh, at the end of the episode, which we will get to. But Ian Schreier will be my guest on episode 39 of the Primetime Rundown interview series powered by by StreamYard that will air right here on Zingo Channel 198 on the I-95 Sports Network Thursday night 8 p.m. and also on the Eastern Observer and the networks of Black Jack Media. Also, fellas, uh, just to continue as well with our cross promotion as well, uh, the New York Scouts, uh, New York Professional Scouts Association, and I and the Eastern Observer will be doing and uh, highlighting a Hall of Famer from. Uh, way, way, way long ago, Alex Pompey, uh, former San Francisco Giants, uh, major league, uh, former major league scout, excuse me, airing tomorrow night or tomorrow morning. My goodness. I am all over the place airing tomorrow morning at 11 AM right here on the Eastern observer and the New York professional scouts association channel. For those that do not know, Alex Pompey was the one that signed the legendary first baseman, Willie McCovey. We will be highlighting them too tomorrow. So that will be pretty cool. And also Pompey was inducted into the hall of fame back in, uh, I believe uh, in the 19, I believe in 2000, uh, 2006, I believe is an African American uh, committee. So that was uh, on the African American committee. So that was pretty cool as well. Um, Also guys, uh, something else that we always like to talk about too. And actually I hate to say it, but, uh, for those that are watching, Al, Al, Carl, John Diaconti, Ryan, Ryan Joy, John Smith, your show is number one on our network. And it's not, I hate to say it, it's really amazing to see because you guys have come such a long way. And episode number 24 comes to you live on Tuesday night, October 20th at 6 p.m. right here on the Eastern Observer and Channel 198 on the I-95 Sports and Entertainment Network on Zingo Television. Really, really good stuff, and those guys do a a fantastic job, especially Ryan Joy, who is now down in Florida, and he's traveling to all of the AEW NXT events and attending them. So uh, may God bless him, especially because uh, it is, again, a hot spot down there, and uh, things are opened up. Uh, so he is able to go get tickets down there and uh, and go see all these events and uh, and broadcast live from uh from there so uh pretty cool stuff there and uh, a couple of one little breaking news tip here from ian schreier before we go uh well uh some things have changed a little bit in this uh houston tampa bay game it's now four to one houston as we are halfway home in game six uh from the game the alcs between the astros and the rays so if houston in their comeback actually so this is only the second game in the series where the rays actually led uh, so the Astros are coming from behind and uh, are now into the Rays bullpen, have chased Blake Snell out of the game. So we could very well see another rally from, uh, as we said before, circa 2004, where a team is actually going to rally from a 3-0 deficit. It's game is not over yet, but possibly to even the series at three games apiece. A ton um, of crazy stuff going on here uh, on the Blackjack Media on the blackjack media networks and also guys just one more quick shout out to our 
main sponsor here, Black Cats NYC, and their pot and their show, uh, or excuse me, their show, their song, if you will, uh, is Dirty Little Hipster. So once again, please download their song, Apple Music, YouTube, Deezer, SoundCloud, uh, Amazon Music, Google Play, Pandora, Spotify, Dirty Little Hipster from Black Cats NYC and Andrew Giordano. Ladies and gentlemen, for one final time, Ian Schreier, Rob DeLuca, I'm Joey Jozinka, and for all of us at the Blackjack Media Group, we'll see you next time.